Hello, welcome for the first time or welcome back to Nine Lessons of Carols for Curious People, which on the night that we actually put the show on, when I say night, I actually mean uh, afternoon, evening, night uh, and then morning again. We did a 24 stroke, 25 hour show on the 12th and 13th of December at King's Place in King's Cross in London. And uh, we had so many different things, including we basically we spoke to people on seven different continents. We have uh, over 30,000 people actually watching on the night. And uh, amongst the highlights were the brilliant neuroscientist David Eagleman, who I always love talking to to find out uh, very often why the shortcomings of my brain might just be because of evolution. It might not purely be my own misuse of it. And we also have in this section the author of one of my favourite science books of the year, The End of Everything, Katie Mack. I hope you enjoy this section of Nine Lessons of Carols for Socially Distanced People. The person we're going to go to next is someone who I've mentioned this many, many times, uh, the author of one of my favourite uh, books, uh, of science books. Came out now, probably almost, not, probably not the beginning of the year, maybe, maybe actually it wasn't. It, all time has changed. She will be able to explain why the passing of time from both the laws of physics and psychology have changed so much during a pandemic. Uh, but her book, End of Everything, about different possible ideas uh, of how we believe the universe ends uh, is an absolutely beautifully written and very funny book uh, at times as well. Uh, so please welcome to your screens, wherever you are, Katie Mack. Hello. Hi, Katie. Hi, Robin. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. The uh, the end of the universe doesn't seem any closer now than it did last time we spoke. <laughs> it still feels like a very, uh, uh, you know, fortunately, the parochial nature of our time. It's all good. Now, the book's been hugely successful. Um, and, uh, and it is a great book. But what I find, what I always enjoy is mm. the delight when physicists talk about these grand ideas. And I know we talked about this before, but when, when we did Infinite Monkey Cage, all of you were mm -hmm. beaming so much, you, Brian Green and Brian Cox, all beaming about, and it looks like you're smiling that there's an end to the universe. But it's not, it's, is it? It's because things have been worked out, I presume. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a combination of things. It's partly just the joy of knowledge and understanding and and playing with big ideas. And it partly is just a sort of, you know, laughing at the, at the, the terrifying nature of, um, of ultimate destruction, you know? So there's, there's some aspect of, I mean, when you're, when you're a cosmologist, you're studying, you know, the beginning of the universe, the evolution of the cosmos, um, things don't happen quickly and they don't change dramatically very much uh, in, in the work that you do. And so when you get to study something where you have big, huge destruction and like everything's torn apart, it's, there's something uh, quite thrilling about that. And, and uh, so I think it's, it's partly just that aspect of something big is happening and, and we get to calculate things about it and we can see something cool happening in our equations. And that's, that's a neat, uh, that's a neat thing. Now, something I found very interesting is that idea that, you know, the universe is still very, almost at its baby stage. We're still, uh, mm -hmm. there's a long life yet. But one of the things that you've talked about before, which is that we are at a good time to investigate the universe because there is going to be a point during yeah. its expansion so yeah, explain explain that. Yeah, yeah. So right now um, we are at a time where we can see distant galaxies. We can see the afterglow of the Big Bang. We can we can see the the beginning of the universe um, to a large degree. Uh, what was going on in the first few hundred thousand years of the cosmos, um, and we can observe the expanse of the universe. If we waited a hundred billion years, we wouldn't be able to see any of that. Um, so in 100 billion years, uh, we won't see other galaxies. Um, we won't see the, the cosmic microwave background that's left over radiation from the Big Bang. Um, and the stars will almost entirely have burned out by then. And so it'll be a very cold, dark, empty cosmos. Um, so it's, it's a good time to do cosmology. Um, and we should, you know, learn as much as we can while we're still able to do that in this cosmos. I mean, we could have been born earlier in the universe. You know, we've had 13.8 billion years. Um, if we had, if we'd come around a few billion years sooner, uh, things wouldn't have been all that different. Uh, in some senses, the sky would have been a little bit more exciting. But, um, but the other thing is that if we'd come about too much sooner, we wouldn't have known about dark energy. The, the, 
mysterious stuff that's making the universe expand faster and faster. And right now we can observe the effects of dark energy. Um, but you know, about 5 billion years ago, we wouldn't have been able to, to really see that. So there's, we're sort of in this good space where we can learn about, you know, the components of the universe that we think are the most important aspects of the cosmos. Um, we can see uh, what's going on at the beginning of the universe. We can, you know, calculate what should happen toward the end because we can see how dark energy is is changing the expansion of the cosmos. Um, and you know, there's still sort of time for things to happen. Uh, whereas if we if we went too far into the future, um, things would really really be wrapping up. Now, talking uh, to Chris Lintop. Uh, a, a few days ago, in fact, probably a few weeks ago, he said one of the worries he sometimes has about the universe is the fact that it's boring. And he says the reason he <laughs> means that it's boring that he says if you take one patch of universe, you can just kind of mm -hmm. just keep replicating that and it will all roughly be the same. Get a big enough patch and you go, there we go, there's roughly the same selection of galaxies, roughly the same kind of shapes. And How do you feel about that kind of idea? <laughs> well, I... I think it's actually really, really useful. So, so this is, you know, some combination of what we call the cosmological principle or the Copernican principle. They're slightly different things, but the the idea behind both of those is that the universe is more or less the same in every direction, more or less the same in every part of the universe. We're not in a special place in the cosmos where things are different here. Things are pretty much the same here as they are, you know, billions and billions of light years away. And that's that's really useful as a cosmologist because when we look out into the cosmos, if we look at something that is billions of light years away, we are seeing it as it was billions of years ago, which means we're learning about the past for the part of the universe that we're seeing really far away. We can't see the past for the part of the universe we're in. We see the present nearby, we see the past far away. But if the universe is more or less the same everywhere, then when we look at uh, you know the births of early galaxies, you know, 10 billion light years away, we are learning about what was going on in our part of space uh, 10 billion years ago. You know, so so we're able to we're able to learn about our origins by looking at the past of very distant reaches of the universe because everything is more or less the same. So it's a, it's a very useful thing if you want to understand where we came from. And if if the universe were not so uniform on large scales, we wouldn't get that information. We'd have a lot less information about what happened in the early time for, for the part of the universe we're in. Now, because uh, we've got people watching all, the, all around the world, but for the UK mm -hmm. audience, uh, those who are still with us at this point, uh, they've reached that kind of blurry, still awake, but almost <laughs> hypnagogic stage. And it seems mm -hmm. that that is the perfect time to explain Boltzmann's brain to, uh, to them, which is something <laughs> you talk about in the book. So, so for those who are yeah. near hypnagogic, explain this idea. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a very strange notion. So, okay, first I have to say, in the very distant future, our universe will probably die in what we call heat death, which actually is not hot. It sounds like heat death, like a big fire. It's just, it's a fading away. So if you if you fast forward billions and billions and trillions and trillions of years from now, all the stars will have burned out. The galaxies will be all so far apart. You, they're all isolated from each other. Black holes will evaporate, everything decays. The universe is basically entirely empty. There's like a stray photon here and there, a little bit of radiation. Um, you know, once in a while, maybe there will be a particle, but that's it. Like it's an empty, empty place. Um, and there's, and that that just persists, probably, you know, continuously. And there, there's this this idea that if you have an environment like that, then every once in a while there will be a little random fluctuation of energy, just from the energy of you know empty space or the these little photons that are floating around or whatever. There will be a little fluctuation of energy, maybe even a quantum fluctuation, and that will you know bring a couple of particles together for a moment, and it'll look like something exists, and then it'll dissipate again. Um, but if you wait long enough, then more and more complicated things can come together. You know, I read a paper where they calculated how long it would take for a grand piano to spontaneously construct itself out of nothing from spontaneous fluctuations of energy in, in this empty, you know, expanding universe. And um, so this, this idea has been suggested as a way to explain the origin of the cosmos. Maybe there was a previous universe, died in a heat death, and then there was a fluctuation that created, you know, our universe from the beginning. And then, you know, that created 
the Big Bang, and then that's that's where we came from. This is an idea that's been floating around. But the problem with that idea is that it takes a really big, rare fluctuation to create the whole cosmos. It seems much more likely that what you would create is just a single galaxy, just from these random fluctuations, right? But more likely than that, it's just going to be a single solar system or a single planet. You know, maybe just one planet will fluctuate out out of the out of the nothing. But you can keep going, and maybe maybe more likely than that, it'll be one person. Or you don't even need a whole person. It could just be the brain of one person, just one brain that thinks that it's been living in a universe that has been around for 13.8 billion years, thinks it observes the cosmic microwave background in other galaxies, and just the that you know, through random chance, molecules came together and created, you know, synapses and, and that and that brain is imagining living in an entire universe. And that's called the Boltzmann brain problem, because if you expect to, you know, fluctuate a universe out of this this nothingness, you're you depending on how you calculate it, and there are different ways to calculate it, we did get different answers, but the certain ways of calculating it, you're much more likely to just be imagining the whole universe. And you, you know, nothing actually exists. You're just, you're just a, a momentary random fluctuation that thinks you've been having this long conversation, thinks you've gotten your PhD and studied physics and all of this, but actually, in in just you know a microsecond, you're gonna you're gonna sort of dissipate into the vacuum again. Um, and this is this is a real problem um, in physics because if you do end up with this sort of eternally expanding empty universe. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to explain why you shouldn't get these Boltzmann brains that think that they're imagining you know that think they're living in a real you know universe with stuff in it, and then it, it's not so much a problem of you know that that shouldn't happen as as like now the none of the questions make sense anymore. If if you can't prove that you're not one of these brains just imagining the universe, then then you can't do any of these calculations and and the whole the whole thing falls apart. Um, and this is not a solved problem. There's still there's still discussions about, you know, wh whether or not we should worry about Boltzmann brains in terms of doing calculations about random fluctuations in an empty post heat death universe, and and you know what what's going to happen then? What does it even mean for that for that state to be reached? So it's a it's it's a fun and weird and and very disturbing problem. <laughs> Well, basically, now that's just another way of us being fluctuations. The one thing that seems inescapable is one way or another, we are just fluctuations and everything we see. So that's kind of... I mean, I mean, we, you know, maybe, um, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, we come out of some other process or, or whatever, but, um, but the, the idea that, that we, that none of this exists except you know, the thoughts in one brain, that's the part that's that's a real problem. Now, I, I remember Brian Cox in one of his books, uh, it, I think it's in the introduction, I can't, it might be Forces of Nature, uh, in which he says, you know, a little existentialism is good for the soul. And then I remember <laughs> asking him, have you ever actually had any existential anxiety whatsoever? And of course he hasn't. <laughs> He's one of those, you know, uh -huh. uh, uh, physicists, those android physicists. But I do know that with you, uh, the, and we talked about this before, about the experience of mm -hmm. writing the book, that, mm -hmm. that you, you didn't, you weren't one of these physicists who is, is detached or merely enjoying the grandeur of where human imagination can take you, that you did feel a connection to somewhere, that anxiety that I think we've talked before about Paul yeah. Dirac. You know, Dirac was a, a genius who had totally accepted the fact that he believed when he died, that was it, it was over and done with, mm. but he could not accept the idea that one day all of the information that had been collected by human mm -hmm. beings and other sentient creatures would also disappear. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that I, I struggled with writing this book. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who is is not super comfortable with the idea that like, oh, we all die, someday I'll die, that'll be it. Like that, you know, that's still a very disturbing thought to me. And uh, and I'm, I spent a couple of years researching and writing a book about the destruction of the entire universe. Uh, so even, even if we did somehow manage to, uh, you know, live forever as software, you know, roaming the stars, like it's still at some point, like the universe dies. Um, and, and furthermore, if the whole universe is gonna die, then at some point, you know, we have no legacy. The the everything we've learned will be forgotten. It won't matter that we've existed. Like there will be some point at which 
everything is totally wiped away. And and that's, you know, that was something that I, I did kind of, it kind of messed with my head at some point, just thinking about that all the time, about the, the just, just the destruction of everything. And and I think eventually, you know, I kind of, I kind of, kind of came to a point where it made me think differently about how we think about meaning in life, you know, um, because if, if the universe is going to end and if everything's going to be erased and there's no sort of legacy or, or final reckoning or, or whatever, if it's just going to go away, then, you know, you need to somehow find a way to have meaning in the moment or, or at least in within the span of your own existence that doesn't rely on future things. And that's, um, you know, it kind of changed my perspective a little bit on, on what we should how we should, you know, respond to the cosmos or to our our lives and our, and the meaning that that we have while we're here. And it made me think that, you know, there has to be, you know, we have to find some way to, uh, to you know, find existence worthwhile and meaningful, even if it won't matter in some cosmic sense in the end, even if we are insignificant and temporary. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'm still not sure I have a, a, a really great, I don't know, understanding or conceptualization of, of, of that notion. But but I definitely it definitely did sort of challenge me to think about, like, is it is it still is there still a purpose if everything goes away eventually? Yeah, I think I I can say that that should remain a quandary. I think if we ever become blasé <laughs> about that, there's something that's been lost. Katie, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, everyone who's watching, if you've thank not you. read it yet, the end of everything by Katie Mack is uh, is a very uh, interesting read, and also, as I said, it's it's it, it's funny as well. It's brilliantly written. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Now, I don't know whether we're going to go uh, to Yanni or Ginny next, so I'm going to find out. We're going to go to Ginny. So, uh, Ginny, who is over in Singapore. Uh, Ginny Smith, are you there? Hi. Right, so right. it's not been so going not very been well going with the well. Boppet. Just I so you know. I have heard that you've broken one of them. No, I haven't broken one of them. It's just, it was <laughs> the one that's all that mended up with gaffer tape already. It's a right old state. Um, <laughs> one, of them does, uh, one of them doesn't even allow you to do the... Right, let's find it. Uh, right, hang on. Oh, I don't know what this one says. So for, for those of you who've not joined us before, uh, Ginny is torturing me by giving me a boppet, uh, which I've never used before. Oh, you see, this one doesn't give me uh, the... Can you hear that? Just about. There's... Uh, oh, there we go. Is that, is that where it is? To be fair, they were bought on eBay secondhand because apparently oh, they don't okay. make Boppet Get the money back on this one. <laughs> I might have accidentally broken the Boppet that's not. Oh, dear. We'll have to. Right. So, uh, so the main thing we've learned is that eventually Boppets annoy me enough that I throw them on an armchair and therefore destroy them with the telekinesis that is in my mind. So I must admit that while I was telling you that I was measuring your reaction time and memory, there was a, another sneaky ulterior motive, which is that we know that emotional regulation is one of the first things to go as people get more tired. So I was wondering if you might get more and more annoyed with it as the night went on. Oh, it wasn't even the night. It was about uh, the first hour. It was, oh. it was not long after I last saw you. I was, uh, okay. To be honest, I was cross before we began. When I was handed this at 11.30 this morning, I was really going, well, why is it this? It's far too technical. I can't spin it and pull it and everything. We'll get this one up and operating again. Okay. So, so explain a few things, because we, we talked about this earlier on, but it is such a... The, the, how much have we managed to break down phases? So once we get beyond... Should we say that on an average day for someone... Is it 15 to 16 hours of being awake and then they will, will go, go towards sleep anyway? So there are actually two different processes that drive you to sleep. And one of them is, as you say, how long you've been awake. So there's a chemical called adenosine, which builds up as your kind of brain cells do their normal daytime processing. And the levels of adenosine in an area of the brain called the basal forebrain um, kind of tell you how long you've been awake. So the longer you've been awake, the more adenosine there is there. The more adenosine there is, the more the brain's going, OK, we've been awake quite a long time. It's time to go to sleep. So that's process one that's going on, and that's entirely based on how long you've been awake. 
But then there's also another process, which is your body clock, your circadian rhythm. And that tells you what time of day it is. And it's the interaction of those two processes that tells you when it's time to sleep. Uh, what about the sensation that I want to actually just fall backwards now? I've just realised that, that, that I'm beginning to lose the, the sense of my middle ear and the sense of balance. Is that a warning oh. sign? It doesn't sound like good news. Um, so you are, right now, it's what, 3.45 uh, there? Yeah, it's about 3.45, yeah. So right now, you are right at the lowest point in your body clock. So um, one of the easiest ways to measure someone's circadian rhythm, because we have all sorts of things that vary with time of day. It's not just how sleepy you feel. It's everything from digestion to how well your cells produce energy. And that's why shift working and things can really kind of mess with your body, because your body's not designed to be up and eating and doing during the night. But one of the other things we can track is body temperature. So I printed off a graph here. I, I think that the words might be backwards, but you should roughly be able to see the shape of it. So this right. shows someone's body temperature, which kind of you warm up during the day. And then around about the time you go to bed, your body temperature drops quite dramatically. And then it's at its lowest point for most people about 3, 4 a.m. And then you start warming up just before you wake up. So that's a really nice way of tracking someone's circadian rhythm. So shall I check and where I am now? Yeah, that would I, be good. I was 36.6, roughly around 36.6, wasn't it, Steve? About about 36.6, wasn't it? Yeah, 36.6, uh, uh, yeah. About uh, when, when we last saw each other. And let's see, that is now... I'm 36.7. Okay, <laughs> interesting. So, <laughs> um, obviously, two data points isn't hugely conclusive, and you are standing on a stage with, I imagine, light shining at you. We well, see, I think that that's what I'm interested in as well, which is the change psychologically of the fact that not merely am I, am I awake, and I'm not doing it just a kind of rhythmic job, that every 10 minutes, Trent is now saying, now you need to go and talk to a quantum mm. cosmologist about the name. Now you need to go and talk to an epidemiologist. Now you need to have a chat about the work of Buster Keaton. Now, so there's all of these different <laughs> things. So it's also that interesting experience of... Uh, Trent, in my ear, just said, is, is it my fault? Yes, it is, Trent. I told you 24 <laughs> hours would destroy us all. Uh, these insomniacs, they drag you into their own world very, very quickly. But, but that, So that, to me, is... Because uh, I remember seeing... Slightly different thing, but um, there was, uh, I used to work on a, a TV show called The Prairie, and they did this thing where they hypnotized one of the presenters to find out what would happen. And in the rehearsal, when he was hypnotized, right, he is doing all those kind of almost, you know, oh, he's eating an onion as if it was an apple. Mm -hmm. But when it actually came to the TV show, it was quite clear that he was faking it a bit. And mm, he wasn't in the same state. And one of the things that we presumed was that adrenaline because it was now a live TV show, had somehow some of, of what happens in, in that fight, flight, etc., make live TV mm -hmm. stuff, had meant that the hypnotism was no longer as effective in terms of his suggestibility. Yeah, I mean, I don't know a huge amount about hypnotism. I think a lot of it is to do with wanting to do the right thing. So generally, as humans, we like to go along with the crowd. We like to please people. And if you're standing on stage and everyone's looking at you expectantly going, oh, come on, he's going to eat the onion, you feel a bit like, well, I should probably just eat the onion because otherwise everyone's going to be really disappointed. Um, I wonder whether it's doing it twice in a row might have messed with things a bit as well. Because you said if they did it in practice and then they did it again quite soon afterwards, uh, maybe that affected it a bit. Um, but it'd be really interesting actually to track your body clock on a normal day because we know that you have a lot of problems with sleep so it may be that your body clock isn't doesn't show quite as dramatic rhythms as other people's and that might be part of the problem that you have with sleep because this this rhythm this um temperature rhythm should persist even if you're up at the wrong time so basically that's what's happening when you're jet lagged is you're now trying to be awake when your body thinks you should be asleep and your temperature dips. And I, I often get that when I'm jet lagged, that I get really cold at mm. sort of weird times. And actually, if you look at that on this um, kind of graph, I, wouldn't, I would think that would be because your body temperature is dipping during the day where it usually should dip at night.
Well, that's, uh, I'm interested in the change in, in age as well, which is, uh, I remember when I used to travel, and if I was kind of going to Australia or something like that, what I would do when I got there would I just go, I'm going to fight through it and then go <laughs> to bed at the right time for this time zone. And you would have an incredibly long day. And I used to have, and it is, and now I've got to that point, especially when I'm on tour around Australia and New Zealand, to go, no, 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 take literally any bits of sleep you can get. To hell with trying to get into the rhythm of it, if you, especially if you're not in a, in the, you've moved to one place, if you're still having to move around, grab it whenever mm. you can. Is that the wrong approach or is it also, is that an approach that I'm having to take because I'm now so aged? So we know that your response to adenosine dulls as you get older. So um, older people aren't as good at judging how long they've been awake. And then often, um, generally often a with age, sleep deteriorates. And we don't fully know why. So um, you kind of don't notice how much adenosine is building up. And then you don't sleep long enough to clear it all. Because the, the kind of ideal is your adenosine levels build up during the day. Then you sleep and your body clears them out. And you wake up and there's no adenosine left. And you feel lovely and alert. But if you don't get enough sleep, there'll be some left. So we know that it does... That, that kind of sense does dull with age. And also your body clock becomes less strong. So um, body clocks, our body clocks control the release of a chemical called melatonin, which mm. um, usually is released around dusk and makes us start feeling sleepy. And in older people, the body clock can shift a bit and the amount of melatonin release can decrease a bit. So um, you often find older people actually get sleepy earlier and wake up earlier compared to kind of young adults. But then if they don't go to bed when their body clock's telling them to and they kind of push through that sleepy phase to still go to bed at 11 p.m. or whatever, then they wake up at 5 a.m. and they're not getting enough sleep, but they don't quite register that they're not getting enough sleep because of the lack of adenosine. Um, so we do know that, that there are a lot of changes um, as people get older. Whether that's the right thing to do or not it's really hard to say we we think that you can only shift your body clock about an hour a day so to try and shift it to get onto um australian time from uk time you have to shift it by what 12 hours 14 hours yeah yeah it's somewhere between 11 and, and 12 yeah so it's going to be two weeks before your body is fully back on track so if you're there for less than two weeks then yeah you might be better off not fully shifting and just trying to sort of, as you say, sleep when you can. We do have a second sort of minor dip in the circadian rhythm mid-afternoon. Um, so it's not as dramatic as the one you get at night time, but that's why a lot of people who nap, they tend to do it at sort of about three o'clock because there is like a little lull in your circadian rhythm. So that can be quite a good time for a nap. Fantastic. Ginny, I think we're going to be seeing you later on today, aren't we? Yes, hopefully when we've got a few more data points. I did have a little look at the data we have so far, and I must admit it's not a particularly interesting graph yet. Um, you're, you don't seem to have shown a huge amount of change no. in how well you're doing. I keep um, it all inside. So, I really do bottle it up. But I'll tell you what, the graph will really change at about 11.50 a.m. <laughs> that's, that's what I was hoping is we could tell whether you are more driven by adenosine or more driven by melatonin in your body clock as to whether so if you were more driven by your body clock you should be worse about now and then start getting better again if you're more driven by adenosine you should keep deteriorating throughout the night oh, but so far you've not really deteriorated at all you've, you've it's pretty much a straight line still so. very frustrated with the whole bop it thing and just yeah that frustration hasn't changed so uh yeah <laughs> as, as usual I, I have a mean average of frustration thank you so much jenny we'll see you uh You're later welcome. on see you later. i'll hopefully make you a more interesting graph for you eventually um i think we're now going to go i'm i keep uh, uh, and I think we're going back over to uh, Australia again. So we, I'm trying to think now. I think, are we up to, how come? Have we done five continents I think, now? Yeah, I think we've done five. I think we're still at five, though. We haven't, we haven't touched. Uh, yeah, so it's Africa and Antarctica. Africa they and Antarctica will be, to go, yeah. So somewhere in the final eight and a half hours, uh, we're going to Africa and Antarctica. But now we're going back to Australia, and we're going to go and see uh, a brilliant, what a really, a, 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 a comedian who had such great material, both about uh, science, uh, many different ideas, have some wonderful physics jokes, and also about The Simpsons as well. I don't know what he's going to talk about now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to your screen. Yanni! Hello, everyone. Uh... I'm not actually 
actually going to talk about so it's science for uh, the Simpsons uh, tonight. Um, I wanted to read a story that I um, wrote. It's a true story. Um, and it's about visiting my grandma at an aged care facility uh, for the first time in six months where there was a COVID outbreak, which is all true. So um, this is a story I've written. If I look a little bit over this way, it's because I haven't quite memorized it, even though it is something that happened in my life. So you'd think I'd be able to recall it. But um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I visited my grandmother to, uh, recently at Twin Parks. So I visited my Yaya Aglaobi recently at Twin Parks. Now, Yaya is the Greek word for grandmother, and Twin Parks is the name of the aged care facility that she's uh, living there, uh, that she's living in. And if the name sounds familiar to you, you may have seen it in the news because there was a COVID outbreak there. COVID, clad in a black leather jacket, COVID-19 strode into Victoria's aged care facilities, firing round after viral round into the elderly and vulnerable. I'm surprised the tabloid newspaper didn't call it the Infirminator. I'm available to write headlines. 80% of the staff at Twin Parks caught COVID. At one point, right, uh, the staff and, sorry, 80% of the staff and uh, the, um, the residents caught COVID. At one point, every staff member either had it or was quarantining because they were a close contact. But as the smoke cleared from the smouldering wreckage, a symbol of defiance and hope remained. A bulleted outline of my 92-year-old Yaya swishing a martini. Stirred? It's possible. She certainly wasn't shaken. It was an epic act of survival worthy of a woman named after one of the sirens in Homer's Odyssey. But because of this, I haven't seen my AR for about six months. I walk into her room and I say hello. She doesn't recognize me straight away. This has happened before. She has dementia. But it's always slightly upsetting when it does. You know, has she declined in the six months since I've seen her? I heard that a lack of mental stimulation can precipitate uh, dementia worsening. I mean, I am wearing a Riot Cop style face shield and a face mask uh, with primary colored dinosaurs on it that my friend Anne-Marie made. Maybe it's just that. Hello, Yaya. She looks confused. It's Yanni, I say. Yanni. Dorothy's son? Blank stare. Right. This is too complicated. I need to go one step back. You know your daughter Dorothy? Ne. Allow me to explain, right? Ne means yes in Greek. Okay? So that does mean that the Greek word for yes does sound like a lot like the English word for na. And, you know, do I use this to bamboozle people advocate in my way? Yeah. So, I'm your daughter's son, Sodas and Dorothy's son, Yanni? Nothing. Finally, I take the mask off. Oh, hello, Yanni Mu. Ah. Just to clarify, all of this is happening in Greek, okay? Now, as much, well, as much Greek as I can manage. Like, people sometimes ask me, Yanni, can you speak Greek? And the best reply I've come up with is to say, well, I can have fairly rudimentary conversations, but I cannot translate the phrase fairly rudimentary conversations. And this is even more true today. Like, you know, as I'm speaking, I feel like I'm fumbling around my sparse Greek vocabulary for the right word and failing that any adequate word. And when I do speak, the words feel unoiled and clunky coming out of my mouth. And I realize that I haven't spoken Greek for over six months since before lockdown. Slightly later, we're sitting in silence. It's hard to know what to talk about with Yaya sometimes. But in a flash of inspiration, it comes to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did Annie Marie tell you that Sienna's pregnant? Sienna. Here we go again. You know your son, Mimi? Nothing. Oh, wait. Mimi's his nickname. You know your son, Emilios? Ne? His daughters. Yeah, he got us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got daughters. Mimi and Michelle got two daughters, Sienna and Alexandra. Suddenly she tweaks. Ah, ne, ne, ne. Okay, so Sienna, ne. We're on a roll here. A cock and fire, she's pregnant, right? I use the wrong form of pregnant, but I'm pretty sure she understands. She's like, no, I said, yes, they're having a little girl. Genuine joy in my AR's face, right? We're having a real moment, and I got to be the one to tell her that her family's getting bigger. I'm pretty chuffed. Oh, you know, yeah, it is good, yeah, yeah, it is. Of course. And she looks at me, a little bit puzzled. You see all about us. I just burst out laughing. I'm like, no, yeah, yeah. I'm not the father. <laughs> Look, we moved to Australia to get out of the village, yeah, yeah, right? Now, morality of the following statement aside, sometimes dementia is really, really funny. Having to explain that you didn't knock up your cousin is quite a moment. Now, as long as you take, don't take yourself too seriously, I can highly recommend it. So 
So weeks later, I hit up Google Translate, right, just for the various forms of the Greek word for pregnant so that I can get it right next time. Chastened, I realized that rather than saying she's pregnant to my yaya, I said we're pregnant, right? Actually, because I mixed up the forms and the tenses, I think I said the following nonsense. Hey, yaya, you know Sienna, she's we're pregnant. So barring the fact that the phrase we're pregnant is a very modern usage and I'd be shocked if my 92-year-old yaya even knew it, I have a moment where I kind of think, wonder whether I'm the imbecile and she's the one pandering to me. Back in the room, I lay it up, yeah, yeah. I say, no, 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 yeah, yeah, Sienna is my cousin. Sienna is your brother. All right, now I do know enough Greek to explain this one. So let's stop here so I can point out how hilarious my yeah, yeah has been. So in Greek, these words sound really similar. Like the word for brother is adelphos, and the word for cousin is xadelphos. Now, I may have sort of painted a picture of my yaya as being a bit vague up until this point, but off the back of outsmarting me, she smashed that wordplay over the long leg boundary. So I may need to reassess, right? She may be an actual genius. So a few days later, quite chuffed, I announced to my mum, oh, yeah, I got to be the one to tell yaya about Sienna. Mum just looks at me like I'm a fool. She's like, no, you didn't. I told her that weeks ago. Oh, it doesn't surprise me, but it upsets me. Like, that's the thing with dementia. Like the person that you love kind of like just drifts in and out of reality, like a radio with a damaged tuner. I think I've forgotten how difficult the constantly shifting realities and constant reevaluations of situations are. Like it probably winded me the first time that it happened. And each subsequent time the winding gets milder, but it still takes some of the air out of you. But that joy in my AR's voice when I told her that Sienna was pregnant, that was real. You know, so I try to find the silver lining, you know. I, pitifully, only got to experience the joy of finding out Sienna was pregnant once. My yaya gets to experience it again and again and again. Back at Twin Parks, my yaya tells me that my auntie's just left and that I just missed her. I say, ah, molis, efigen molis, right? Which is uh, saying, oh, she she left just now, just recently. And I feel quite pleased with myself for remembering the word. Ne, ne, mueferen fayi, she brought me food. Oh, that's nice, yaya, what did she bring you? Mueferen mia salada. She brought me a salad. Well, what kind of salad, yeah, yeah? Me tomata with tomato. Yeah, di chialo. What else? Me diri. Like, wait, what? Cheese. Yeah, yeah, never had a salad with cheese. I said, yeah, yeah, you had a salad with cheese in it? She's like, ne, ne, you know. Itan ye tomata, ke diri. Egan and san a sandwich, right? Yeah, she made it like a sandwich, right? Now, the thing you need to know here is um, that we have a biscuit in Australia, like called a salada biscuit. It's going to make more sense if you know that, but... Uh, <laughs> In the real story, I assume knowledge, but suddenly I have a thought, right? I, I, I go, the Greek word for salad is salata. So I ask her, I say, yeah, yeah, was it a salata? And I'd like act out eating a salad like with a fork. I said, or was it a salada? And I put my hand out like, you know, like a sandwich. And she goes, eat that salada. I said, oh, right, a salada. I do the palm, you know, not a salada. I do the fork. She's like, no, I didn't have a salada, right? This is hilarious. I'm Abbott, she's Costello, and we're doing who's on first. Did Marie bring you anything else? I ask. Ma'am, where if I didn't get us yet, right? She bought me cherries. She looks around for them. Now, I have noticed the cherries. They look very nice. There's about five of them left on a small tupper, in a small Tupperware container on that slide-on table that they only have at hospitals and old folks' homes. Do you like cherries, Yanni Mu? Now, uh, I should point out, Mu, right, after something or someone endows possession, right? So... Yannimo means my yan, right? And it is a staple phrase of yayas. Right? I will bet you dollars to donuts that Alexander the Great's yaya, yaya the Great, at some point pinched his cheeks and was like, did you conquer Egypt? Bravo, Alexander Mu. So I respond in the affirmative. Yeah, 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 I like cherries. She's like, Ella Faya Gerasia, eat some cherries. I look over at these five remaining cherries. There's so few left, like, I don't want to take them away from her. I heard I hear this absurd phrase coming out of my mouth. So it's okay, yeah, yeah. It's cherry season. I've got heaps at home. Maybe I hear this. Really, you do? I say, yeah, I do. The thing is, I don't. Right? There's another pause. Fine. Yeah, eat. I yield and I take a cherry. Put it in my mouth. It's very nice. And with my mouth still full, I say, mmm, it's good. She says, do de fai Well, if it's good. Eat another one. It's solid advice. 
Later, I was at home, and I wondered why I did that. Like, I don't think I really know how to be around my Yaya now that she's in the aged care facility. Like, she's 92, and I look at her, and I don't know how many more times I'm going to get to see her. It's a strange thought, and it's making me do strange things. Like, I realize that I'm looking at my Yaya like she has so little of her life left that, what, I have to preserve it, or and I do that somehow by refusing a cherry. Shockingly, I realized like, that the way I picture my AI in my mind has drifted so far away from her being my AI that I, I didn't even see that she was trying to feed me and I was saying no. <laughs> but I'm denying both myself and her the pleasure of sharing the food with me on the assumption that what, you know, that her eating that cherry alone by herself after I've gone is going to be better. Like, it's ridiculous and it doesn't make any sense, which is what makes me think that I might not completely be resolved to what's going on. And I must be uncomfortable because I wouldn't deny being fed by Yo-Yo Ya my work, to my worst enemy, right? It's, it's a beautiful thing. Ella, buy it, buy it, come, take, eat. Uh, and I realize that I'm seeing her as a frail, helpless woman and physically, she is that, but that's not her essence, you know. Like, it doesn't matter if she sometimes forgets things or even who I am, but, but her generosity and her desire to share things with me and to nurture me, like, those things transcend her body. Those things aren't enfeebled by age. If anything, it's, uh, it's a grander gesture now. I mean, look, anyone can offer you food when they spend all day cooking and the fridge is full of leftovers, but one of your last five cherries, that's matrix-level yay yay. She didn't care how many were left either. That was the other thing. Take as many as you want. She only had five. But if she had five million, I could have had five million. She wanted to share them with me. Who was I to say no? I could have eaten everything in that room and she wouldn't have been mad. No. She would have been proud of me and proud of herself for forgetting the sort of Greek Cypriot man who burst through the door in riot gear and a dinosaur mask scarfs an elderly woman's last morsels of food, then bounds out again, weighed down only by their full belly, right? The nurses had come in. She'd like parade me around in broken English. She'd be like, this is my grandson. You will notice all the food gone whilst beaming. And there's a joy in that pride. You know, granted it's granted in archaic gender roles and baked in cultural power imbalance. But when you're a kid, you don't know any of that stuff and you don't care. Just bring me more dolmades. And she does, and you eat them, and it gives her joy. Real joy in whatever's left in my AR's life isn't going to come from treating a cherry like it's some archaeological artifact to be stored under glass and conserved at any cost. It's, that only makes sense if you see life as this vanishing thing to cling to desperately, even at the cost of suffocating whatever's left in it. It reminded me of something my partner pointed out to me recently. I love passion fruit. In fact, if anything, I love it too much, right? I love passion fruit so much that after years of scarfing them down as soon as I got home, I began to make a conscious decision to not eat them all at once so as to space them out over a longer period to conserve them. It's a noble goal and certainly preferable to glutton, but eventually it got to a point where I was so good at not eating them right away that I ended up throwing some of them out because they'd spoiled, right? And this is one of my favorite foods. Like, what a ludicrous overcorrection. My AI is going to die someday. I don't know when that is. But being so scared about the days that she won't be here shouldn't mean not appreciating the days that she is. And that appreciation won't come from maximizing the things that she has, be it money or jewelry or even a cherry. It'll come from sharing genuine moments and spending whatever time that we have left together. You know, from listening to those stories she's told me 300 times, one time more. The one about how she got married at 15 after she met my Bapu, when he, who was uh, the lead singer in a band that was playing at a wedding in her village. About how my Bapu came over to Australia a year earlier just to set up before her and my mum and my auntie came over. Um, about how my great-grandfather painted like innumerable religious icons in churches around Australia the joy of just holding her hand. Like, I think I may have had to break some COVID rules to do that, but I just thought she must have gone months without someone holding her hand lovingly. I couldn't deny her that simple thing. I mean, she's not going to catch COVID. I'm 
that you've got the martini glass to prove it. Like our food, our stories, companionship, listening, you know, just being present, body and mind, and seeing someone and the simple act of loving them. The joy of sharing these things doesn't age, it doesn't deteriorate. These are the things that have made life worth living before any of us were born and that will continue to make life worth living after all of us are dead. Those are the things that I'll miss after my AI is gone. So I mustn't be so focused on the cherries that I miss the bigger picture. Of course, it doesn't have to be either or. Next time I visit her, I'm going to take a big bag of cherries and Yaya can have as many as she wants. And I'll sneak in a couple of fat Cuban cigars too because it's not every day you knock up your cousin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yanni. Thank you for that. Uh, this has been... It's interesting. When you communicate stories like this, um, I, uh, I, I've found it in the last few years, more and more people doing storytelling and sometimes which has initially come from stand-up. No, I didn't, but now it's back on. Oh. What's, we I, gonna... I, I mean, are you trying to chat to me, Robin? Because I can't hear you very well. Oh, okay. Thing. I'll tell you what. We'll, if, if not, because we're overrunning anyway, and I can't hear very... Let's just hear it for Yanni! And go and find out more about Yanni's work, and we will put up some stuff about him. Um, <clears throat> because uh, we've reached that point now where, if the connection's not working, we're moving straight on. And uh, I think we're going to, with luck, uh, we are ready with our next guest, uh, who is uh, a neuroscientist who has been on Monkey Cage numerous times. Uh, I've done book shambles with him and lots of other things. And, uh, and our science Q&A as well. And uh, you've sent in your questions. And please keep sending in your questions if you have neuroscience questions now. Uh, please welcome to whichever screen you're at, David Eagleman. Great to see you, Robin. Hi, David. How are you? I'm awesome. How are you doing? Good. Can I just see both your arms, by the way? Yes. You are recovered then because the last time we worked together, you had just had an injury. Exactly right. I broke, I broke several fingers on my hand. But everything yeah. is good. Right. We have got the questions yeah. are just about to come up. Now, this is the thing that I, I we, we've just been talking with some other people as well uh, about this because Steve and I have now been on stage. We're in the 17th hour now and trying to work out the difference between tired when you're doing a kind of a job which just has a rhythm to it. And tired when you're doing kind of uh, a, a, a strange job of the focus of outsiders and and with, you know, both for Steve and myself constantly having to change, uh, right, now we're with this person, now we're with this. The kind of social brain has to maintain yeah. fully active for 17 hours. What are the things that, what should we look out for as the warning signs of when we must flee? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, staying awake just burns a lot of energy and being social and thinking about what you're going to say next and dealing with different personalities. That also takes a lot of energy. And so my guess is that you're pretty hungry in between, you know, whenever you're taking a 10 minute break here or there, you're probably really hungry and you're going to sleep like a king at the end of this. I hope so. I hope that now we've got loads of questions and uh, uh, they haven't actually gone up on the screen yet, so I'm going to wait for them. I, I, first of all, I, I'll tell you what, we'll talk about some of your, your, the, the, the new book as well while I'm just waiting for the audience questions to, to pop up on the screen. Um, I, I found it's such an interesting thing talking about the cutoff point because we never got to this on Monkey Cage. If you remember on Monkey Cage, we got to question one and not beyond, uh, which is always what happens with the human brain. Um, but I am still fascinated with various different skills where there is a cutoff point in our neural, you know, that, that, that if you have not learned them by six or seven years old, the brain will never be able to. And yet at the same time, the book also tells stories of people who have lost a large area of their brain, you know, sometimes up to, up, up to, up to half the brain and have then adapted to be able to uh, master various skills which we might have previously presumed were specific to one hemisphere or other. So can you, is there a difference between that initial learning stage and its inability, and then this other side of it, which is the brain, what is left of it when there has been severe damage, to relearn? Yeah, I mean, the general story is as humans, we drop into the world sort of half-baked, and then we absorb everything around us, our culture, our language, the beliefs of the people around us, and so on. That has been a very successful strategy for Mother Nature. We've taken over the whole planet. We have 24-hour podcasts. We do all kinds of great stuff. 
But there are these windows that you're pointing to where if the brain by the age of, let's say, uh, three or four has not gotten any language, it loses the ability to learn a language. It just can't do it. It doesn't get how that works. Um, and there are various things like that along the way. Now, what happens with what's called a hemispherectomy, when half the brain is removed in a young child, what this demonstrates actually is a lot of redundancy because your left and your right hemispheres are essentially carbon copies of each other, although there are some subtle differences. But it turns out you can remove half and the other half says, oh, shit, I need to just rewire a little bit of stuff over here. But it's essentially a, you know, a nice redundant system. Um, but, you know, both hemispheres have been exposed to language from day one. And that's the important part. That's really interesting. That that so because that that sense of I mean th I've read in some books where they do talk about the idea uh, uh, this multitude inside us. This idea as again for those people who've had a, uh, a, a is it I'm trying to think it's the corsum colossum when the, when 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 that is uh, severed and you have a separate right brain and a separate left brain and you sometimes hear of these cases where there is an argument going on between the two where someone is doing up their shirt and the other side of them is undoing the buttons which appears to be an illustration of just how many people, or not perhaps people, but how many personalities become funneled out as this single person. Oh, exactly right. And in fact, I know, I mean, this was a decade ago almost, but you, know, you read my book Incognito, and the thing I argue for there is thinking about the brain as a team of rivals, because what's actually happening is you have lots of different neural networks that all have different drives at the same time. You've got this parliament of different voices going on. And what happens is the brain's really good at funneling down to a single decision. So if I put some chocolate chip cookies in front of you, part of your brain wants to eat that. It's a rich energy source. Part of your brain says, don't eat it, you'll get fat. Part of your brain says, okay, I'll eat it, but I'll, I'll promise to go to the gym tomorrow or whatever. And you can argue with yourself. You can cuss at yourself. You can cajole yourself. You can you know, contract, with, uh, who's talking to whom here? It's all you, but it's different parts of you that are all running. And at different times, different parties in your parliament will, will win. Um, and so you might make a different decision, even though you have all these drives going on at the same time. Now, this is, I, I don't know, uh, this might be too, I was talking a, a while ago with the neuroscientist when I was, when I was a kid, I talked, or when I was a student, I talked about this idea, and it's one of the ones that you have to be really careful about talking about publicly. Now, very often we talk about different levels of consciousness in different species, where we might observe it in chimpanzees or bonobos, orangutans, then maybe less so in, in, in gorillas. But what he ended up talking about was, we never talk about the fact that in human beings, there is a, may well be a range of self-awareness and consciousness, that actually the idea that all humans have roughly the same level of self-consciousness, actually there could be quite a kind of range within that. What do you think to that? Well, this is actually my next book. I'm working on it now. I probably won't be done with this for two years, but but it's um, it's exactly about the differences between people, which is fascinating because we always assume, yeah, all brains are equal. In fact, as you may remember, Robin, I'm very involved in the legal system where neuroscience meets the legal system because we make the assumption that all brains are equal. And, um, and that's a very charitable assumption, but it's demonstrably false. Along any axis that you measure human behavior, you find a big distribution, whether that's aggression or empathy or skill at chess or skill at swimming or whatever the thing is, you find people are all quite like really different from one another. So, um, yeah, this is exactly what I'm examining is, you know, from schizophrenia to psychopathy to synesthesia to saints and sinners and so on, like all the ways that we can be quite different from, from one another. And I'll tell you something interesting, which is if you look around a room and you see the differences in people's faces, you know, the eye distance, intraocular distance and nose length and frenulum and all this stuff, all the stuff that AI uses to do face recognition – um, there's a lot of difference actually between people's faces. It turns out there's that much difference in people's brains as well. So all the students that have ever been in my lab, I, I can recognize them just by looking at a scan of their brain because their brains are all physically quite different. So I can, you know, so that's, you know, so-and-so's brain, so-and-so's. Um, anyway, it's not just the shape of the brain. It's everything about not only the genes they dropped into the world with, but every experience they've ever had 
this sends brains off on very different trajectories um, in the world. So, yes, I completely agree with your guest that, um, yeah, consciousness may well be a different experience. Now, one other thing, this is something that's come up. It's one of those things, that the, the, the book that I wrote, which, of course, doesn't have the depth of yours, which was kind of skating over various different ideas of psychology and comedy and stuff. And it was one of those things that a couple of sentences in it led to a lot of different conversations. And in a chapter, uh, I wrote about ideas of why we become who we become. You know, this is very loose ideas of these different, quite often anecdotal stories, especially around comedians. Um, and then this led to a lot of conversations with people. At one of the problems of human beings is many of the incidents in our early lives, which may well shape who we become, are almost irretrievable to us as well because they happen at a stage before we are ourselves. To, to give us a, now, do you, from, from your own work, are there ways that we are able in some ways to access some sense because I think that's the bit where people are trying to understand themselves and they can't see the incident, you know, especially if it's kind of you know, one of those uh, you know, flashbulb moments that, that has happened in someone's life. Yeah, I mean, so of course you're exactly right. Boys don't remember anything before they're about three and a half, girls three. But of course, during those years, those are your major formative years where you're finding out what sorts of things do I do that make – People laugh or get angry at me or what, what happened, you know. So you're figuring out so much about the social world in those few years before you're laying down any memories at all. And beyond that, there's this issue that so much happens to you in a day. So I have two kids, five and eight years old, and I sometimes watch for this point about how many experiences they have in a day. Some happy, some sad, some angry, some boring. They have so many experiences. And Every one of these shapes their brain in particular directions. And so by the time they are sitting in a college dorm at the age of 20 talking about, oh, here's why I'm that kind of person, it's all going to be a false narrative because they can't possibly retrieve all of the things that have happened to them, much less the things that they don't remember, as you point out. It's, it's such a fascinating area. Now, with some of the questions we've had come in, uh, what, here's one, which is, uh, are reflexes built in? Can you train yourself to have better basic reflexes? Ah, uh, reflexes are built in, yeah. Um, yeah, this is something like, you know, if I touch something hot that travels up the peripheral arms of my arm to my spinal cord and straight back out to withdraw the muscles before ever getting to the brain. So reflexes are something that can happen without the brain even being involved. So um, those, uh, you, you, um, you can't do anything to improve those. What you can do, of course, is, um, for example, sprinters getting off the block, you know, you can put yourself in the right mindset so that you're really listening for the sound and the second it goes, you go and you're, you know, you're relaxed or your muscles are tense in the right way, but that's about the best you can do there. Yeah. <laughs> Do, do you ever worry about, and I know, I, I know you, you certainly wrote about it in, in The Brain, which is, you know, was also a TV series, where uh, that sense that almost everything is a reflex and then the frontal lobes kick in with a post hoc rationalization. Yeah, yeah. Um, this may well be true. We don't know for sure that it's true, but it certainly is a possibility um, that, you know, so what is what we do know for sure is that almost everything is happening unconsciously. You don't have any access to or acquaintance with why you're doing what you're doing. And, um, you know, for example, think about when you have an idea and you say, oh, I just thought of something. It wasn't exactly you that thought of it. Your brain's been working on that for days or weeks behind the scenes, consolidating information, generating hypotheses, evaluating those things. At some point, it serves it up to your consciousness. You say, oh, I'm a genius, but it wasn't, wasn't exactly you. And so um, there, this is true of almost everything. I mean, just take something like you know, lifting, lifting my phone to my ear. The, the motor act of listening and getting it right up there, it's underpinned by a lightning storm of brain activity that allows me to move my muscles so smoothly and do that. I don't know how I do it. All I know is whether I, you know, drop my phone or not. So I've access to, but it's like this with everything, recognizing a friend's face, falling in love, driving a car, getting a joke. All these things are totally unconscious. You don't know how you're doing it. You're just enjoying the, the outcome of it. Um, and so, yes, one of the hypotheses that is suggested 
um, is that consciousness might actually be just a post hoc thing that happens, you know, 500 milliseconds after everything's been decided that sort of tells the story about why you think you did what you did. So intriguing. This is, uh, can you tell someone's emotions purely from a brain scan? And to what level of accuracy, if at all? I mean, this is an interesting area. You might want to enlarge on that. Is what, how much we are actually able to tell, and what if you could also enlighten us to some extent, what we are not really able to tell due to the scenario, the situation, etc. Yeah, there's two main issues. One is that with brain scans, we're actually just getting the smallest whispers of signal in the noise. And that's why for any brain scan study that you ever read, you know, you average 20 people and you say, okay, look, on average, when people do this, you see this little blip of activity in these regions here. So that's one thing. It's very hard to tell anything in an individual. But even if you could, our fanciest technology, brain scanning with fMRI, is a very crude technology. And it's the best thing we've got in 2020. But Lord knows in, in 20, 30 years, we're going to look back at this time and you know, it'll be unbelievable that we ever spent our careers working with this lousy technology because all it can show you is where you're getting more oxygenated blood, which is a proxy for where there just was activity three seconds ago. And that's all this thing is telling you. And um, <clears throat> in order to know anything about the brain, what we'd really want is a technology that can tell us with your 86 billion neurons, what's firing where, you know, every neuron in your brain is firing between 10 and 100s or you know, hundreds of times per second, every single one of these. In order to crack anything about the neural code, we're fundamentally gonna need to be able to read all of that stuff. So in answer to the question, no, you can't tell much of anything except for whether somebody is in a high emotional state or not. That's really all you can tell. And now this, this, this one I think could take a while. This is, can neuroscience explain our sense of self, the part of it, us which feels like it is looking down on our brain, trying to understand it? So what I think that question really is, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to be able to do it, uh, what is consciousness? You can do that in yeah, a couple of minutes, yeah. can't you? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, I'll preface by saying this is, this is probably the central mystery in neuroscience. We have no idea why you put together all these cells and you get something like a sense of self or a consciousness. Um, and of course, consciousness is very fragile. And, you know, if you get hit in the head, it goes away. Or when you go into a deep sleep, it's gone. And then you wake up and it flickers to life and you're aware of what's going on around you. We don't know how that happens. We don't even know what such a theory would look like because it's very difficult to say, okay, look, I'm going to do a triple integral here and carry the two and, and, and that's going to equal the taste of feta cheese or the smell of cinnamon or the beauty of a sunset that I'm watching. We don't even know how to make those two languages talk to each other. So it's a very difficult problem. Um, we don't think that, you know, my laptop, for example, which contains billions of transistors, we don't think that it's conscious as I'm moving around with Skype and Microsoft Word and so on. Um, so yeah, this is this is a very deep mystery. My own suspicion is that it, you know, it, it's sort of like a, an operating system at the level of, you know, your neurons are microscopically tiny, and you've got 86 billion of these. What you need is, as a giant creature in the world, you need to worry about things at your level of space and time, which is very different from what the neurons are worried about. So it's just sort of an operating level system thing where you have some way of saying, okay, well, you know, she likes me. He's angry at me and is bigger than me. Uh, you know, I'm going to go over here to get food, whatever. Those are the things that you need to worry about at your giant level of space and time. See, that's, a, I mean, once we have, because you have these wonderful experiments where people can, you know, kind of prod the brain tissue and create certain sensations without actually the uh, exterior existence of, but once we're able to just prod a bit of the brain to create a sunset over Nashville in our minds, then we're into Philip K. Dick territory anyway, aren't we? Yeah, that's right. But I mean, we have that every night. Every night you go to bed and you have, you know, complete bizarre reality. I mean, you totally believe your dreams hook, line and sinker when you're in them. Um, you know, you, uh, you're in reality and then you wake up and you say, oh, now I'm in this one. So that one must've been fake. Um, but yeah, there's a sense in which we're already doing this. 
Thank you so much for joining us, David. Your new book, as, as usual, is, is a fantastic look at, at different ideas. Of Again, we show our understanding of our brain, the limitations of our brain, and uh, and it's always a joy. So uh, uh, David's latest book is from Cannon Gate. For all your books, I think, are for, uh, from Cannon Gate, yep. aren't they, in the UK? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yep. they are fantastic. So thank you very much. Uh, should I live through the rest of the eight hours? I may well see you again on Infinite Monkey Cage. Cheers, David. Thank you. Bye, Ron. Thanks very much for watching, and uh, thanks very much to everyone who supports us for our Patreon. If you don't as yet, but you would like to, or in fact, even if you wouldn't really like to, but you feel you should, that would be good as well, uh, then go to patreon.com. We are the Cosmic Shambles Network, and I hope you feel you're able to support us, and we can keep making somewhere between four and ten shows a week covering uh, the arts, covering the science, and covering anything in the kind of blurred in-between area as well. <laughs>